When you choose the lesser of two evils, always remember that it is still an evil. Okay, you're probably wondering why I bought an Alienware. Well, there are several factors that have influenced my decision, most of it coming from the US to Canadian dollar conversion and what my budget can afford as a result. Yeah, kinda sucks, no? Well, here's what $1,000 worth of laptop can buy you. Less than stellar single core performance, and a GPU that can at best play CSGO or Dota 2. However, no information exists for the Alpha R2 base models R9M470X outside of this one sketchy game facts comparison with the R7370 and a few videos that most likely underutilize the GPU. So, it's up to me to take one for the team and tell you guys if this thing sucks. Startup is fairly straightforward in that you read the EULA, set your privacy settings, connect to a wireless network, and assign a name to the user. Additionally, the Alpha R2 is surprisingly lacking in bloatware, sporting only the Steam client, the Kodi Home Theater app, and Alien Effects, which lets you customize your lights. Not much else to say really, moving on. With the Alienware brand targeting the gamer demographic, I have decided to test several games, slowly escalating my benchmark by graphical intensity, starting with the rather low-end Tales of Berseria while slowly moving my way up to Shadow Warrior 2. In some cases, I will also include a 768p test since this is considered to be the native resolution of a portable television, in the event that the user is traveling or in other cases where their primary gaming solution is absent. Kicking off my review as well, probably the least hardware-intense AAA game that has come out in the past year. There are probably better games for me to kick off the benchmark, but due to me loving the fact that Tails is now on PC, Barring the 16x anisotropic filtering and FXAA medium, all settings are default configuration. Additionally, I will only be looking at the demo rather than the full game. As far as performance goes, the battles run at a flawless 60fps. I wish I could say the same thing about the field screen, as there have been drop frames scattered throughout my playthrough, and their random nature makes a 768p test rather pointless as seen in the background video. However, these stutters are absent in the battle screen, and because of this, I give this a 9 out of 10. Another cross-gen game, Metal Gear Solid 5, has often been hailed as a marvel in graphical optimization thanks to the Fox Engine. Testing the game at 1080p and on these settings, I personally didn't have too many problems, and drop frames weren't nearly as noticeable than on Berseria. However, the actual results on the 1080p tests are debatable, though on the 768p test, the Alienware has little to no problems, 8 out of 10. I'll be honest, my expectations for this weren't all that great due to one statement from Tripwire stating that the PlayStation 4 version would be balanced differently, with my first thought being less Zeds. Turns out that the recommended setting is actually the high preset, and as far as a six-man suicidal game is concerned, the game actually ran pretty damn well, with occasional dips that could be credited to crawler swarms and three sirens screaming at your face. With the results shown on this graph, I'm personally confident that a 768p test is unnecessary. Going off of the Digital Foundry config, I would personally say that performance is on par with the PlayStation 4 version of the game, with the benchmark showing off the many different environments of San Andreas, eventually ending at Los Santos. Interesting enough is that while I did try to aim for a medium config, the overall performance makes little difference with the downtown portion of the benchmark. Changing the resolution seems to be the only way to improve it. To me, it seems as if the best way to play GTA V on this system is with the PS4's high-slash-very-high config. I'd say 8.5 out of 10, if only due to the 30fps target on the console versions. I'll admit that there were definitely some better choices for an Unreal Engine 4 benchmark, though this game's pretty much the closest thing to Commander Keen 7 that we'll ever have. Anyways... I feel as if it's because of Unreal Engine 4 that I'm seeing the results that I have gained, and this is after I have turned down the settings to what you see on this background video. Here's hoping it matches the upcoming console versions, I guess? Then again, the 768p performance does allow for more precise platforming. Still, I wish I could aim for the high preset.
with Shadow Warrior 2 releasing on the PS4 and Xbox One, I decided to go off from these settings and attempt to match the graphics on the console versions. While texture detail appears to be on the medium setting on Digital Foundry's comparison video, I decided to bump things up due to having the VRAM to spare. With all the other settings thrown into the mix, I'm not entirely confident with the 1080p results. 900p is much more playable, though at this point you're matching the Xbox One version of the game. Having played this game on both the Alienware and a GTX 1060 desktop, however, I can safely say that this is definitely not a 30fps game, so... Much better. Anyways, I can't say that I'm a fan of chromatic aberration, and the depth of field rarely ever adds anything to a first-person shooter. Even with the toned-down visuals, however, I think Shadow Warrior 2's visuals hold up pretty damn well, and if you're traveling with the Alienware, it's unlikely that you would have a 1080p display anyways. I guess you can play Shadow Warrior 2 on the Xbox One's visual quality, but knowing how fast-paced it is, I really don't think it's worth it. I guess this concludes the... A NEW CHALLENGER COMES! Originally, I wanted to include Nier Automata and Doom 4 in this video, though the Fraps benchmarking tool doesn't work on either. Recording frames per second on either game would require phone cam footage due to video recording software adversely affecting performance. However, covering multiple games through the phone cam method is just... No. But if I have to, I'd better be brief as possible, so... I hope you read that warning on the screen!
Okay, after analyzing my phone cam footage, it appears as if the heaviest hits on my frames per second appears to be... particle effects. Still, the Alienware Alpha manages to hover between 52 and 80 frames per second with very rare dips around the mid-40s. Don't know what else to say besides showing the settings that I have used. With these factors in mind, this should closely match the PlayStation 4 version of the game, though I have set particle quality to low since the performance cost is pretty damn high for a negligible upgrade in visual quality. Okay, you know how I said that this has more value for money than a 950M laptop in the introduction? I'm sure you'll want a more precise breakdown than just buying a box under your TV versus a laptop. For comparison's sake, I have decided to include what I feel is the bare minimum of what you need in terms of peripherals. In this corner, we have the MSI GL72 Gaming Laptop. As listed by Quebec's own Canada Computers, this little bugger will set you back by $1,000 and features a 2.6GHz quad-core processor, 8GB of RAM, and, well, offers a 950M GPU, which I said earlier isn't meant for anything more intense than CSGO. Oh, and chances are you probably aren't going to play games on the laptop's touchpad, so let's throw in a cheap $16 5-button mouse from Amazon. Now let's look at the Alpha R2. $800 for the gaming performance that you saw in the past couple of benchmarks, but it isn't without its flaws, the most notable of which being that you need a screen to connect to along with an audio source. Enter the Supersonic SC1511, which will likely set you back by $184. However, the awkward placement of the TV's HDMI port will force you to buy a right angle that will set you back by a price no higher than $8. And let's say you want to use your microphone. Another $11 for a USB sound card. Oh, and if you're not a fan of the standard Dell USB mouse, let's throw in the Zelotes that we paired with the laptop. Looks like the laptop's marginally less expensive, though again. GPU that can't play anything harder than CSGO versus a small form factor PC that closely matches the current gen consoles. Real tough decision, don't you think? While I have personally tested this machine for family parties and anime conventions, I feel as if it is necessary to give a more accurate testimonial in regards to how portable this is. To do this, I will grab a 17-inch notebook bag and fill it with most of the peripherals mentioned in the value for money category, a set of sleepwear, an Xbox 360 controller, and a towel. The goal of this is to see if the backpack is within Air Canada's personal baggage requirements, and if not, you will rule out the portability factor. Well shit, didn't get a chance to weigh this thing and it already failed the portability test. Barring the portability factor, I actually liked what the Alpha R2 had to offer in terms of its baseline. Very little bloatware and console-like performance combined with the utility of Windows. The main downsides of this machine is the lack of a headphone jack and that the Alienware graphics amp is only available to the 960 model. Another thing worth noting is that this review is actually poorly timed due to the introduction of the GTX 1050 laptops. With that said, I feel as if the Alpha has given me some insight about the money being saved by taking the laptop's battery out of the equation. I hope we see more of these small form factor PCs in the future, especially if AMD brings the Vega architecture to the notebook market. Also, if this video proves to be sufficiently popular and I find the time to spare, I may also look into a standalone near Automata video, or if you really want to see this thing cry you a river, I may instead throw Space Hulk Deathwing at it. <laughs>